In today's video, I'm going to teach you how to predict Jupiter and Jupiter's ability to give you a worthwhile husband. In astrology, Jupiter represents the husband. Everything that the husband's going to do or not do is determined by Jupiter's well-being. If you've got a great Jupiter, you're going to get a husband that does a lot of great things in your life. If you've got a bad Jupiter, you're going to get a husband that doesn't do a lot of great things in your life. Okay? So the place to start your whole analysis, when if you're a woman and you're wondering about your husband and married life, is with your Jupiter. Okay? This is a critical part of astrology. I regularly see people who go get their charts read about a relationship. And the astrologer doesn't really take a thorough look at their Jupiter. They say, oh, this planet's in the seventh house, so you'll have a great marriage or a bad marriage. But marriage is, hinges upon your husband and what your husband will produce in your life or what he won't produce in your life. And you want a productive husband that makes your life better, right? Isn't that what it's all about? You can have a good seventh house and get married and have lots of great sex, but if you don't have a good Jupiter, you don't have a productive husband, which is worse than having no husband at all. So we have to look at Jupiter to start with. He's the, he's the husband as a producer in your life, as someone who can make things happen for you, who can enrich your life. Okay? Now why do we use Jupiter as the husband? Why Jupiter? Well, we use Jupiter because Men and women's mate, meaning Jupiter for a woman and Venus, or, or you know, Jupiter is the husband for a woman and Venus is the wife for a man, are completely different things. The merit required to have a good husband in this lifetime is not the same merit as required to have a good wife in this lifetime. Okay? They're different things. Jupiter specifically is the husband, and it represents the merit the woman has achieved spiritually. Jupiter, we know, is the spiritual planet, right? It's the planet of philosophy and religion and yoga and spiritual practices. And through cultivating those activities, a woman generates spiritual merit, and her Jupiter essentially gets generated. And part of that spiritual merit, not all of it, but some of that spiritual merit, God and your soul decide to store up in order to create your husband. Okay? But if either there's not a lot of accrued spiritual merit, or the spiritual merit that is accrued is going elsewhere, then you don't get a good husband. Okay? Say so you get a husband that doesn't make you enrich your life, doesn't make it better. Okay? Now, um, Jupiter we know is faith. And as a woman, you want to have a husband you have faith in. And by faith I mean a husband that you can count on. That you know he'll be there when you need him to be there. To do the things you need to do when you need him done. And that's instinctive in women. Why? Because women are extremely vulnerable during some periods of their life. And that period is known as pregnancy. Because of that, there's a, a biological need within women to have a dependable man, somebody who's useful, someone who can do something right. Because of this reason, women are attracted to men with power and with money. It's not because women want power and money and they're greedy little evil fiends that just want to go shopping all the time. No. It's because biologically and instinctively, they want a man that has demonstrated that he's capable. Capable of for what? For taking care of her during those vulnerable times in her life when she can't take care of herself. When she's eight months pregnant, okay? Or when she's, you know, after pregnancy and has a health trauma. All these things that can happen. When she's stressed out from running around keeping those kids alive and trying to feed the kids and using her bodily resources to feed those kids. She needs a dependable man there, a capable man who can, who can take care of her and provide what she needs to so she can do her share. Okay? So, a woman is not after power and money. She wants the security 
She wants a capable man that's demonstrated that he can provide security. So women are naturally attracted to that type of man. Okay? Um, so a woman wants a man she can have faith in. Faith in that he'll be there when she needs him to be there. Okay? And also, um, and, and of course, faith is a property of Jupiter. Jupiter is the planet of faith. Okay? And faith comes from acquiring spiritual merit. Through doing spiritual practices, we begin to see God in our daily lives. Seeing God in our daily lives, we have faith in life, which means faith in God. Because so many crazy things happen in life, right, that don't make sense. But when we see God in our daily lives through spiritual practices, then we have faith in those crazy things. Okay? And we develop the, and we have faith and we acquire spiritual merit. And for a woman, some of that spiritual merit gets stored up for her man. And that's why Jupiter is the man in a woman's chart. The right man is productive, he's capable, and he's a provider. And he's not just a provider of money and wealth, which is Jupiter. He's a provider of wisdom, which is Jupiter, of guidance, which is Jupiter, of joy, which is Jupiter. Okay, Jupiter's the planet of joy. And Jupiter is also the planet of generation, the planet which we generate children with. Jupiter is creative. It also means a husband that's creative, that can find ways to live life productively, who can be creative with her, you know, a creative person. Jupiter is a genius. Why? Well, Mercury is intellectual, but Jupiter is a genius. Why? Because Jupiter has that creative vision. Okay, Jupiter is an extremely creative planet. After the sun, those are the two big creative planets. So, you know, a creative man can solve problems. A creative man can always find the solution. A creative man can always make the best of every opportunity. And that makes a man more capable. These are all qualities of Jupiter that women want. So, you know, um, Jupiter brings, again, to reiterate, money, um, wisdom, joy, creativity. These are some of the big things that Jupiter brings. And these are all things, these are all due to accruing spiritual merit. And that merit gets stored up as a man. Okay? So if your Jupiter has problems, then not a lot of your spiritual merit has been stored up to create this two-legged man in front of you. And as a result, if that's the case, the man will fail you. Okay? And you'll constantly be disappointed. And you won't be able to have faith in your man. Because that's what it's all about. Good Jupiter, faith in your man. Which means good fortune in marriage and, and stuff. Bad Jupiter, no faith in your man. Why? Because he hasn't deserved it. He won't be capable. Okay? He won't be useful. He won't be up to your level of ability. He won't be smart enough for you. He won't work hard enough for you. He won't make enough money for you. So you're stuck with the man who you make more than him, you're smarter than him, you're more creative than him, and you're more capable than him, and you work harder than him, then chances are your Jupiter is suffering. Because that's usually the type of Jupiter women get when they have a bad man, a bad Jupiter. A woman wants a man that they can have faith in. Which means, when the woman feels like she's going to fail, or can't do something, having a man around that can take up the slack is the man she can have faith in. Just like us on God. We have faith in God because when we get decimated down here, we feel there's someone we can go to who can get us out of this bind. Well, women want to be the same way with their man. They want to have faith in their man. Meaning, during those rare moments where they're so vulnerable that they can't manage something, they have a man who can step in and take care of it. Not that they're needy, but biologically women get into very vulnerable positions when they're pregnant. So they want a man who they can have faith in. It's just an instinctive biological thing. Okay? Alright. So we have to judge Jupiter right. And to start with that, you have to calculate your chart right. Okay? Now, I'm going to teach you how to judge Jupiter right. You can use any calculations, any Ayanamsha, any zodiac you want to do that. But unless you're using the calculations that I tell you to use, I don't want to be held responsible for the interpretations that you may have, whether right or wrong. Okay? 
So if you want to ask me questions and ask comments about your chart, make sure you calculate your chart on my chart calculator. Okay? My chart calculator is at vaultoftheheavens.com. V-A-U-L-T-O-F-T-H-E, heavens, H-E-A-V-E-N-S.com. Okay? If you use that chart calculator, which will calculate everything you need for this chart, okay, then you can ask me questions. Okay? But otherwise, I don't want to be responsible for anything that you might see or I might say. Because we're going to use a technique that's extremely precise. Okay? Meaning, which means it's a good technique that works. If it's extremely precise, we need the right calculations. If you're using a technique that's not really that precise, that's not super accurate, you can use loose calculations and get a decent reading. Okay? But we're going to use very precise calculations precise technique, so you have to have it calculated the way that it works, okay? And when you punch your chart into vaultofheavens.com, you're going to get a much, much different chart than you're probably used to looking at. On that website, there'll be a link to an explanation for that if you care to wonder, if you're wondering why that is, okay? All right, so on to how we judge Jupiter. First of all, we have to examine Jupiter in three charts. The var first Varga, the Rashi chart, the seventh or the Saptamsha, and the ninth or the Navamsha. Okay? Now, Jupiter is your husband in those charts all in different ways. Okay? In the Rashi chart, Jupiter is your husband in the sense of being able to support and further your path in life. So, whatever direction you're going in life, is your husband's presence in, li in life going to make that easier? and more effortless, and more secure, and more safe, and more abundant, or not. Okay? Now, you don't need your husband to help you with your own personal path in life. You can do that all by yourself. Okay? You can do that as an individual. But having the husband who can do that and boost that is nice, but it's certainly not as essential. So don't be all too affected by the condition your Jupiter is in, in the Rashi chart. Okay? It's not going to make or break your marital happiness. It's gonna, not going to make or break having a great husband or not. If it is good there, great. So much the better. Okay? Because then your husband will be able to benefit your life in a more well-rounded way. But it's not critical. Okay? Then we have to look at the seventh Varga, the D7, the Septamsha. Now the Septamsha is the chart of partnership. It's the chart of sex and the offspring of sex, which is children. The Saptamsha is a chart of co-creating with another person. You can do so many things by yourself, which essentially is the Rashi chart. That's your individual path. But there's some things you can only do with another person. Like you can only have sex and have children with another person. There's no way you can do that by yourself, right? So anything that you do that you wouldn't have done if you didn't have another person in your life is your seventh Varga. If you have a strong seventh Varga, you do a lot of things with your partner that you would have never done had you never met them. If you got a weak Saptamsha, you might have a partner, but you'll never really do anything different with that partner than you would have if you'd never met them. You know, hardly anything different. Okay? So the stronger your Saptamsha, the stronger partnership is that affects your life in a positive way, meaning in a way that brings more into your life, more of what you wouldn't have done without that partner. All the fun things you do that you wouldn't do by yourself, like having sex is one of them, but all the other fun things too is the Septamsha. Anything that you would do with a person that you wouldn't do by yourself is the Septamsha. And you want your husband, Jupiter, to be strong in that chart. Because Jupiter is the most critical planet in the Saptamsha, believe it or not. Okay? So, you want a husband that's... Ju you want a chart, in your chart you want Jupiter to be strong so that your husband is in actively involved in the relationship. He's actively involved in the partnership. He's actively involved in doing things and initiating things and planning things and thinking about things that makes your life full of things
that you wouldn't have done if it wasn't for him. Okay? If you got a weak Jupiter in the Septamsha, okay, then you might have a husband and you do all these things with him, but you're the one who thought about him, you're the one who planned him, you're probably the one who paid for him, you're the one who created them, you're the one who thought of him. You would have, you would have just come up with all those things all by yourself. And he's just like your little puppy dog coming along for the drive. And that's not as good as having a man who's really there, full of creative, creative energy, full of life. Jupiter's plant name is Jiva, which means life. That's one of Jupiter's names. Who's full of inspiration and full of joy to do and create and do things with you. Okay? So that's what you want a nice Jupiter for in the Septamsha. Okay? Then you also want to look at Jupiter in the Da Samsha. Uh, da Samsha, sorry, the Navamsha, the D9, the ninth Varga. The Navamsha is the chart of marriage, but it's really not. It's the chart of your ashram. What is your ashram? It's the path you choose in life. Do you choose a Brahmachari ashram? In India, there's three traditional ashrams. The Brahmachari ashram is the ashram of being a devoted student, applying every bit of yourself to perfecting some, something through study and training and practice. So like if you're, if you're an athlete and you want to be a world-class athlete, you're focused on becoming the best athlete and you train and you study to become the best athlete, you're, that's your brahmachari path. And a true athlete, that's all he does. He lives for that sport and he doesn't worry about other things. That life, that path of being the greatest athlete he can be makes his life narrow. Okay. Or the person wants to learn things and go to the university and study and expand his knowledge. Those are brahmachari ashram, where a person wants to perfect some part of themselves through training and development of knowledge and intelligence. Okay? If a person has a good navamsha, when they're in that mode of their life, they don't let distractions get in their way. They're not the athlete who goes and smokes pot after the race, or who goes partying the night before the race. Okay? He's an athlete that's at bed at 10 o'clock every day, wakes up at 6 every day, trains every day, and doesn't get distracted, okay? So that's the brahmachari path. And then there's the marriage path, okay, which is the householder path, the path of having a partnership with somebody, and that partnership becoming bigger than oneself, and living for that partnership more than oneself, and not living for that other person, because living with it for another person never works, because people will always disappoint you. That's just the nature of the business. These people are not gods. They're just even to you, and, you know, humans are, are failures. You know, we have too many failing points to not ever disappoint somebody. So, marriage ashram is about living for a partnership, okay? And the partnership takes on its own life and provides all these great things to itself and to the world at large and to the children. And so, it makes two people live for something greater than themselves. So they're able to make sacrifices for that thing, and that makes them have a nice narrow path in life. The same way that the brahmachari is living for his studies or living for his training, and so that gives them a nice narrow path in life. But the ninth house is all about living for something greater than yourself. Then the other type of ashram is the sannyasi ashram, the ashram of, you know, devoting your entire being to developing spiritually. Okay, where you don't care about, you know, marriage, you don't care about what you're good at, you don't care about getting smart, you don't care about getting fit. All you care about is finding God. That's your path. And part of finding God is maintaining your health and being fit enough to do your spiritual practices, and that's all part of it. It's not because of those things, it's all for that spiritual focus. So one basically becomes a renunciation of all things except the desire to find God. And all those are paths that are to, of things that are more important than the individual ego. So a good Navamsha is a person who can commit to a path. And in committing to that path, the individual ego becomes less important and therefore less, prob or less problematic. Okay? With a bad Navamsha, you never feel secure and firm on a path. It's like we see a lot around the temples and you know, and around the world. We get all these people who really want to do yoga and into yoga and they talk about religion and spirituality, but at the same time they don't know if they want to be married. So they go in and out of relationships and so they're not secure on the marriage path 
and they're not secure on the sannyasi path, and they're not secure on, and on the brahmachari path either, and so their lives are just a giant mess. So the Nabamsha is considered so important because we want to get on a path. And once we're on that path, we want to be anchored in that path and feel like this is the right path for me, even when it's hard. A bad Nabamsha is this is not even hard and it feels like the wrong path, or gosh, things are hard now and it's, I don't feel like it's the right path and I want out of here. I want to break out of my ashram. So the Nabamsha is the ashram, and the most common ashram is the marriage ashram. People getting together and trying to live a life together and trying to live a life for a partnership and a family instead of living a life for a single individual ego. So, in Jupiter, you need your Nabamsha, your, in your Nabamsha, you want Jupiter strong because that shows the husband is supporting the path. Your husband is supporting the ideal of marriage. The husband is supporting the idea of relationship. That, you know, the husband is supporting not you as a person, but you as a partner in a relationship. It's supporting your relationship path, your ashram. So whatever path you're on, you want your husband to support that path and to believe in that path and, believe, and to believe in you on that path. Okay? If you have a bad Jupiter there, you get, a, you get a husband who doesn't encourage your path, doesn't encourage the success of your path, which means the success of your marriage. Okay? Which means he won't be doing the right things that a marriage or partnership needs. If you want your husband to do the right things that your partnership needs, you need a good Jupiter in the Navamsha. Okay? If you want your husband to be doing the right things to make you happy as a person, to share with, to have fun with, to have sex with, to have a partnership with, that's Jupiter in the Septamsha. But you want a husband that really supports your path and helps you get down your path. And when you're married to him, that means your mutual marriage path to do his fair share towards the partnership. Meaning, oh, sure, he's always there and we have great sex, but then he doesn't do anything for the partnership. Or we have great sex, but he won't ask me for, to marry me and take me to the next level of my partnership. Well, that's showing Jupiter's having fun in the Subtamsha, but he's not there in the Navamsha. So you need your husband to be there in the long term for the path that you choose to be on, which is your Navamsha. Lots of times we want to have a decent Jupiter in the Subtamsha and they'll meet some great guys. But, in, you know, in lots of ways that they have great partnership experiences with. But in the Nabamsha, Jupiter is not good, and as a result, he never wants to get. He doesn't want to get married, or he's not in a position to get married, or he, um, you know, he, he's just not into it. Or he, and once they get married, the relationship deteriorates, and that's a very common thing. Good Septamsha Jupiter and bad Nabamsha Jupiter. As soon as they get married, which is they enter that ashram, the relationship decays. So. Sometimes people do better in partnerships, you know, relationships, but then they fall, fail in marriage because of that Jupiter being weak in the Navamsha. And again, this only applies to a woman's chart, what we're talking about. Your husband's ability to make your partnership ashram, your marriage ashram, a success. And you want your husband to be capable of making your marriage ashram a success. I always get charts all the time of women who you know, I look and it's your Jupiter. It's like Jupiter's trash in the Navamsha. And I say, don't worry, the divorce is not your fault. It's his fault. But on those rare times when a woman comes in and Jupiter's good and she's going through divorce, I know the divorce is actually her fault. Okay? So, and then her planets that represent her will be causing mischief in the Navamsha. And so she couldn't walk that path, even though her husband was trying to make that path happen. But most of the women who come, unfortunately, have a terrible Jupiter in that chart. And so they marry men who are complete failures when it comes to living for a partnership. Meaning, when it comes to living for something greater than themselves. Okay? And that's the critical thing about a partnership. Don't think of a partnership as this thing as, oh, it's where two people come together and have fun? No. That's subtumption. That's sex and partnership. A relationship, a marriage, is when two people come together 
and involve themselves in things that are more important than either person as an individual. The social impact they have, the impact they have on their children, those are more important than the impact they have each other on each other's little ego. Okay? And that's what it's like. The same way when you become a you know, you become a um, sannyasi, a sannyasi who wants to go to the ashram and live in the ashram. He's no longer important anymore. He's living for the ashram life. He's living for the path of finding God. The only thing important to that person is the path. They're like so unimportant. Same in a marriage. In a marriage, both people are unimportant compared to the partnership. And you want your husband to be in the partnership, to be partnership centered. You don't want him just to have fun with you and then want to go fishing with his friends all the time and not care about the partnership and the kids and the marriage and the anniversaries and whatever. Okay? So how do we judge Jupiter now that we know what we're looking at? Okay, well, the first thing we want to do is check the dignity. Um, and that's based on natural friendships and something called uh, what we call a Jagrat Adhyavashta. Now, that means Jagrat means awake. So it's the awake and other avashtas, and avashtas means conditions. We basically want to see if your Jupiter is awake, which is great, because you want a husband who's awake, who's awake to be your partner, and awake to be creative, and awake to love you. And you want your husband who's going to be awake in the Devamsha to take care of the partnership, and to emphasize the marriage, and to support the ashram path that you've joined together. And to ask, be awake to know it's time to marry you. You know, you get the husband, you're like, okay, it's been five years, 15 days, and three and a half minutes, and you still haven't married me? Well, if you're looking at your watch, babe, it's because your Jupiter in the Navamsha is not good, and your husband's not awake to take the next step along that path with you. So Jupiter is awake when he is, here's Jupiter up here, when he's in Pisces, Okay, Sagittarius and Cancer. So basically if Jupiter is in his own sign or exalted, he's awake. And that's the best planet. That means your husband's really paying attention. He's paying attention to you, he's paying attention to your relationship, he's doing what you need for you, and he's doing what the relationship needs for the relationship. That's the best kind of husband. Wide awake. Okay? Also, Jupiter's in Pisces, Sag, or Cancer. If Jupiter's wide awake in the Rashi chart, then he's awake and ready to support you in whatever your goals are. Okay? That's the best Jupiter. Now, there's another state called sleeping. That's the worst state. That one, Jupiter's sleeping. He's absolutely comatose. He's so sleeping. Then if you dump a bucket of water on his head and kick him and tickle him and make the kids jump on him, he's not going to get up. Okay? That's when Jupiter, we're going to write down here, we'll put the bad Jupiters here. That's when Jupiter is in Capricorn, his sign of debilitation, or when he's in the sign of his natural enemies. His natural enemies are Mercury and Venus. So if he's in the sign of Gemini, Virgo, Libra, or Taurus, then he is sleeping, which means he's useless almost, unless there's some redeeming things that we're going to look for. Okay? Capricorn, Gemini, Virgo, Libra, Taurus. And that's shocking. That means five out of seven times, because these are five signs, five out of seven times, Jupiter is going to be sleeping. Dang, girls, you have it rough. That's just not fair. Okay? Now look at the funny thing. In a man's chart, we do this with Venus. Venus sleeps in Cancer and Leo. I think that's it, right? And Virgo. Venus is only sleeping in 3 out of 12 signs. That's why I always tell men, and why, as it always works, when relationships fail, most of the time it's the man's fault. Because more often than not, the husband's sleeping, whereas the wife is more regularly awake, or somewhat awake, and ready to make the relationship work. Okay? 
So if you've got Jupiter in Capricorn, Gemini, Virgo, Libra, or Taurus, you've got a sleeping husband. Which means getting him to do anything that you need is going to be hard. If Jupiter's sleeping in the Rashi chart, okay, he's not going to have probably the tools, the money, the ability or wisdom or knowledge to encourage and support you in everything in your life. You won't be able to come to him for everything. Okay? Who cares? You just need to come to him for the critical things, which is Septamsha and Navamsha. But if Jupiter's sleeping in the Septamsha, he won't be there for you creatively. Okay? He won't be there um, in a way that you can have faith in him. Okay? Um, you know, he won't be the person initiating and taking care of things and making you feel like part of a partnership, okay? Um, he won't be there making you feel life. He won't be there for the kids, okay? Things like that. He won't be a co-creative partner with you because he'll be sleeping and you'll be kicking him and going, let's go do this. I need you to do this. And he's like... Not even getting up. So if you're always nagging your man to do anything useful, look at your Septamsha. Okay? Now another thing, okay, and then I'll talk about the Navamsha. In the Navamsha, if Jupiter's asleep, he's not doing anything to further your marriage or whatever ashram you're in. He's not taking the next step for marriage. He's not doing what makes you feel like the marriage is a great entity that's better than each of you guys as an individual. What he's doing is just making you do all that and feeling drained and wondering why you've been married to this guy and how is marriage a great thing that's better than being an individual when you're dragging along this big pile of fat blob that's sleeping on your couch. Okay? That's what a bad Jupiter is like. Okay, now, so basically when Jupiter's sleeping, it's really hard for a woman to get a man that's worthy of her. Okay? Now, what do you think happens when a woman gets a man that's not worthy of her? What's her options? There's one option, right? Try to find another man. And that's what always happens under Jupiter periods when Jupiter's sleeping in a woman's chart. The man she's with is not worthy of her. She's, he's not doing the right things that a man needs to do to have a good relationship or to support the marriage or support her and her dreams. And so he's really just a burden, and so she will try to find another man, naturally. Sleeping Jupiter, as part of that, can incline a woman to have affairs. Because another way to have a, a, a man you can't have full faith in, is to have an affair with a man. So a man who's already got so many responsibilities, that he can't be there for you all the time. And then how can you have faith in a guy who can't be there for you all the time? You can't. So that's another sign of a sleeping Jupiter. A sleeping Jupiter is a man who can't be there for you in the right ways all the time. So your faith is not going to be fulfilled. Your faith and need in a man will not be fulfilled. Sure, that can come because your husband is just a lazy bones and totally uncreative and doesn't make any money, has a terrible job, no education. But it also can be because your man has all those things, but he's strapped down with another woman that he has to take care of and he's a more, you know, not a more, but he's still got 10 kids that he has to take care of. And whatever. So he can't do all that for you. So be aware that sleeping Jupiter in the Saptamsha or Navamsha can easily cause you to come into situations where you find yourself attracted to capable, successful men that you still don't get to have full faith in because they're already with somebody else. Or you can not have faith in a guy because the guys you're with are just useless. Okay? Now I know by now half of you all are depressing and getting depressed and looking for your gun cabinet and want to end it all, but don't worry. There's ways you can fix your terrible Jupiter if you have that. But I'm going to tell you that at the end, okay? So just hang in there. So, if Jupiter's sleeping, we're in trouble. If Jupiter's awake, great, okay? Now, if Jupiter is sleeping, I want you to give it a value of minus 60. That means sick Jupiter is dragging your life down to 60 negative points. If Jupiter is awake, I want you to give Jupiter 60 points. Which means Jupiter's 
there to a full nice measure of 60. Now these aren't completely accurate numbers. There's a way to scientifically work all this out precisely if you want to learn that. You need to take my video courses and really learn to split those numbers. But these numbers are going to be sufficient for you to analyze your chart better than any astrologer is ever going to. Okay? So, if it's awake, give it 60. If it's sleeping, give it minus 60. If it's in any other sign, then Jupiter is going to be what's called sleepy. Sleepy means he's not wide awake, he's not seen it all by himself, but he's not snoring on the couch either. Which means, if you, if you let him know, he'll jump up and take care of it. He won't see it all by himself, like an awake Jupiter was, who's seen everything and knows and everything that you're going through. But if you signal it to him, he'll know. And he'll take care of it. So that's a good guy too. So if Jupiter's in any other sign, which is in the between these two extremes, give him 30 points of good. So he's half as good as a wide awake husband. Okay? And 30 is good enough. A, a sleepy but their husband is good. But a sleepy and a not their husband ain't going to help you very well. So you look at Jupiter's dignity in the Rashi, Septamsha, and the Vamsha. The Septamsha, Septamsha and the Vamsha are the critical two to look at. Okay, those are the critical two to look at. But then we also have to, and these can be dramatically influenced by the planets influencing Jupiter. Now we have to look at the planets influencing Jupiter in the Rashi chart. And whatever we see in the Rashi chart, we want to carry over to the other Varga charts. So first, we want to look at Jupiter's friends. Does Jupiter have any friends helping him? If Jupiter has friends helping him, it helps Jupiter get some life to do the right thing. And then, and then he can still be a good husband, or a decent husband, a good enough husband, if, even if Jupiter's sleeping. So his friends are Mars and the Moon. So if Jupiter is conjunct Mars or the Moon, add 60 points to Jupiter. Okay? And this is only in the Rashi chart. Don't look at the conjunctions and don't look at the aspects in the Varga charts for this technique. Just look at the Rashi chart. Okay? So if in the Rashi chart, Mars and Moon are conjunct Jupiter, give 60 points for each of them. Alright, so if Jupiter is debilitated, sleeping in the Navamsha, but joined the Moon in the Rashi, now your husband's at zero. He's an average guy. He's not great, but he's not a useless person either. And you have a chance. Okay? But if Jupiter's debilitated in the Navamsha and the Septamsha, or he's debilitated in the Navamsha and in Gemini in the Septamsha, you know, he's sleeping in both charts, well then he's at minus 120, right? And then, just the Moon is not going to bail that Jupiter out. For that, you're going to need the Moon and Mars. Okay, both his friends helping him. So yeah, I know you're thinking, well wait, Mars is a cruel planet, he's a malefic. Yeah, he is. He's a malefic. You know what he's going to do? He's going to poke your husband in the butt, and your husband's going to go, ouch, that hurts, I better get off my bum and do what I'm supposed to do. So you see, malefics can be good. But Jupiter, Mars is a friend of Jupiter, so he gets Jupiter to do more of what he's supposed to, even though he does it by poking him in the butt. Okay? Alright, and what this means is, your husband will respond to logic. Okay? And he'll do the logically right thing, which is what you want him to do. Okay? Alright. The moon is sensitive. If the moon is influencing Jupiter, your husband's just going to be more sensitive and more aware of what you're going through. And that kind of, so even though he's sleeping, he's having a dream about you because he's so sensitive to what you're going through. So he wakes up and goes, oh wait, something's wrong with my wife. I dreamt about it. I better go see. And then he goes and helps you. Okay? So the moon makes Jupiter more sensitive. makes your husband more sensitive to what your needs are. It opens his eyes a little bit. So, if Mars or Moon are conjunct Jupiter, give it 60 points for each of them, okay? And only look at the conjunction in the Rashi chart. Then, look for the Sun. The Sun is a friend of Jupiter, too. But the Sun has a special rule that any time the Sun's conjunct any planet, that planet suffers, okay? So if the Sun conjuncts Jupiter, even though he's it's the friend, you still want to knock 60 points off that Jupiter. The reason is because any planet you have conjunct with the Sun 
is a planet that in this lifetime you have to make some sacrifice towards in order for your spiritual development to take place, in order for you to find your true self, which is your sun, in order for you to connect with the soul of all the universe. So if your sun is conjunct Jupiter in the chart, they're together, that means you have to sacrifice some of your hopes for a man in order to make the spiritual growth and individual growth that you need to in this lifetime. And that hurts. That's why the sun is a malefic, a cruel planet. He fries, he burns, he sacrifices any planet with it. So you can have Jupiter and Pisces in your Navamsha and Septamsha and have the sun with it and you still are going to have to make some huge sacrifice about what you're going to get from your husband for your own spiritual growth, okay, for your personal spiritual and individual development. So you may have this great husband that at some point you have to sacrifice a big chunk of what you want from him in your lifetime, okay? And it'll be a noble sacrifice, because the sun's a noble planet. Now, what is sacrifice? It's, it's giving away something with an understanding of greatness. So, like when we sacrifice our goats and stuff in the backyard as a bunch of pagans, we don't really do that, I'm making a joke. But if we were sacrificing our goats and our fruit on the back altar in the backyard, we'd be going, oh, poor little goat, I'm going to miss you, but I understand this is for a greater purpose, okay? And it hurts to murder the goat, but if it's done for a greater purpose. Okay? Sacrifice. Well, I'm going to give $100 to the church. I'm making a sacrifice of this money. But I do it for a greater purpose, so it's worthwhile. So sacrifice is a good and noble thing. Though, really, I don't get into sacrificing jokes. It's like a crude joke. Forgive me. All right. But that's what happens when sons with Jupiter. You have to sacrifice some of the needs you hope to have from your husband for your own spiritual growth. And when it happens, it'll hurt, but you'll know it's what's right to do. Okay? But that still knocks 60 points off your son because that's going to make your, your Jupiter, your husband, at some point less able in your life. And you'll have some disappointment from him, and that disappointment will cause you to constantly make that sacrifice to grow. Okay? But it's not a punishment. It's like, like, ooh, you were evil in your last lifetime, so your husband's going to fail you on this. No, it's like, okay, you're ready to take a step beyond husband and embrace your own faith and become a greater whole person. So you're going to have to kick your husband a little bit, okay? Suffer a little bit from your husband. Okay, now, Mars, Moon, and Sun are also friends to Jupiter, okay? Which means if they're aspecting Jupiter, they'll also help Jupiter. Aspect in the Rashi chart. Now, to do this right, you can't just use so-called full aspects and say, well, my Jupiter's over here in Aries and my, well, I'll put Jupiter in Taurus. My Jupiter's in Taurus and my Sun is in Scorpio and the Sun is aspecting Taurus, so I'm going to give Jupiter some benefit. No, that's not what we're doing here. We have to measure the aspect exactly the way that Parashar recommends where you get a value from 0 to 60 points. So Jupiter will be aspected by the Sun by a value from 0 to 60 points almost all the time. It might just be 2 points, it might be 58 points. In fact, Jupiter can be here at the beginning of Taurus and Sun can be at the end of Libra and it could be aspecting Jupiter 58 points and you can get all this boost. Even though according to full aspects, which are largely not very useful, Sun wouldn't be in aspecting Jupiter. So you have to calculate the aspect exactly and look at Jupiter and say, oh, it's getting this much aspect from the Sun. If the Sun's in the 12th and 2nd from Jupiter, it won't be aspecting. It definitely won't be aspecting at all if it's in the 2nd. It may be aspecting the teensy teensy bit if it's in the 12th. But if it's in any other house, it'll be aspecting something. So no matter where the Sun is, Look and see if it's aspecting Jupiter. And the same for the Moon and the same for Mars. If it's aspecting them, add that to the benefit of Jupiter. So say that Jupiter's sleeping in your Septumsha, but he's got a 30-point aspect of Mars, a 20-point aspect of Moon, and a 40 aspect of Sun. Well, that's 40 plus 20 plus, what I say, 30? That's 90 points. That's going to make up for sun being sleeping in the Septumsha chart, okay? So, 
add those aspects. Now, if you go to the chart calculator at vaultoftheheavens.com that I told you about earlier, on your chart, there'll be a little square. And in that square, I'll have the, it'll say aspects to planets or aspects to grahas. Along the top, it's going to have the planets getting aspected. Along the side, it'll have the planets that are aspecting. So you just go to your Jupiter and go down, and it'll go Sun and a number. That number is the aspect from the Sun. Then it'll say Moon and a number. That's the aspect the Sun gets from his, the Moon. And Mars and a number. And that'll give you an aspect of how much Mars is helping the Sun. And see which of these friends are helping Sun or Jupiter. But remember, Sun conjuncting Jupiter will hurt him, but aspecting, he'll help him. He's a friend. Okay? So Jupiter's got three planets to bail him out. That's great. Now Mercury and Venus are enemies to Jupiter. Okay? So if they're conjunct Jupiter in the Rashi chart, knock off 60 points from Jupiter. Okay? If, um, if Venus, okay, or if they aspect Jupiter, so if Mercury and Ju Venus aspect Jupiter, look at your little aspect table that's in that chart calculator, and subtract that much aspect from Jupiter's ability to produce a good husband. But then again, you're adding the aspects of friends. Okay? Alright. <clears throat> so, and in Mercury and Venus are enemies. And that sounds weird. You're thinking, oh, wait a minute, but, you know, Venus is a friend, of, is a benefit. How can that be bad? Well, just go and see. When you see men who've got, if you've got a Venus-Jupiter conjunction in your chart, you'll find sexual relationships tend to get in the way of other good parts of relationships. Okay? It's not good to have Venus or Mercury aspect your Jupiter. Um, Venus influencing your Jupiter means your husband will care more about um, fulfillment than doing the right thing. So, when he has a choice of being, doing the right thing, and coming home for supper, and doing his secretary, there's a good chance he'll be doing his secretary. Okay? It's not a good combination for maintaining the balance of marriage. Okay? Um, Jupiter is a planet of purpose. Okay? He needs to have, this is the purpose I want to live under. And that's what, when you find a man who's capable and successful, he has that. Because he said, okay, I'm going to do this. And he does it. That requires focus. When Mercury influences Jupiter, it shows the husband doesn't have a focus. Okay, Mercury gets too trivial and too much, oh, this is cool, this is cool, this is cool. And so then the husband's not focused on any great thing. To it. He doesn't have the capability for success. And his life tends to be more scattered. And his thoughts about you and the marriage will be more scattered too. You want a husband who's focused on you. Okay? When Mercury is influencing Jupiter, your husband just won't be as focused on you. When Venus is influencing Jupiter, he just won't be, his creativity will not be focused enough on you, I guess is a good way of saying. It. His creativity will be too spread out. Like I said, it's a combination that can indicate your husband gets attracted and has relationships with other women. Okay? All right. Um, and oftentimes in your own chart, if you've got like a Venus-Jupiter conjunction, um, especially Jupiter-Venus conjunctions in the 2nd, 7th, and 10th houses, will tend to incline whoever has that, whether male or female, to have a lot of sexual relations. Okay? Um, Venus influencing Jupiter... Um, also... For Jupiter, one of the reasons Jupiter is able to support a vision is because it has that vision. And vision comes from our spirituality and our spiritual creativity. So, if you have a vision for a marriage, Jupiter wants to maintain the vision for that marriage. Okay? Venus, however, is not a creative planet like that. He doesn't have a vision that he searches. Venus is very pragmatic. He goes, this is the situation of life on Earth, and this is the environment I grew up on, and so this is what's going to determine my vision. 
And then you get a husband who lives in accordance with what's happening around you in your environment. And if you look around and you see all the crazy things that happen in marriage and husbands not you know, being responsible and 50% of women are raising children alone and lots of those people, their husbands don't even want to pay child care, that's sort of normal. You know, that's the here and now of life on earth. And Venus is very inclined to, when it's influencing Jupiter, it's not that Venus is inclined to doing all that, it's just Jupiter is what keeps us having a better vision. Whereas Venus shows us the real vision. And our Venus's job is to show us the real vision and learn and teach us to live as healthily within what's really happening as possible. And that's a good part of Venus. Like so if you're a single mom and you're raising your kids alone, well that's the reality of your life and your good Venus can help you figure out the best way to manage all that. But when Venus influences the Jupiter, the vision, uh, the husband's vision for a greater and better existence is diminished in the fact of what is there. And you want that vision because it's that vision that creates the inspiration that maintains and increases love and maintains and increases the purpose of a marriage. Without that vision, if it's just, if the, the only vision is for what's around you, it's like, why even bother? You know, like my brother, I remember my brother said, he goes, gosh, when I look around, I just don't see, and I see people getting married, it doesn't make me want to get married. He goes, when I see everyone's marriage, I don't want to get married. You know, and so the reality of it, if you look around at other people's marriages, it's like, why would you want that, right? But if you have a good Jupiter, your husband, even though he can see everyone else's marriage is, you know, shitty, he still has a vision that he can have a great marriage with you. And so he can create that vision. But when Venus is influencing that vision, he can't create that vision because of what he sees around him, what he sees on TV, what he sees around him and the people and the friends, and, you know. And so the vision Jupiter gets shattered when it's with Venus. And you don't want that. And then when that vision is shattered, all one can do is join the masses. Okay? And that keeps your relationship from feeling special. That feels, that keeps a man from giving the attitude of what we're doing together is really special. It's worth fighting for. It's worth being together for. You know, even though we have this and this problem. You know, there's the vision of we, we still have something special. When Venus is influencing Jupiter and the problems come, the husband's like, you know, it's like every yeah, other screwed up relationship around here. Sure, let's head on down to divorce court. No big deal. This is what happens in this world. And you don't want your husband to say that when you're having problems, right? You want your husband to say, look, we're married. We're doing all these great things. We have this great purpose for each other. And you want him to create a vision for you guys to work towards. Well, if, you have, if Jupiter's influenced by Venus strongly, by conjunction or strong aspect, your husband won't have that vision to share with you. Okay, and then right away, kind of the you know the wind leaves the sails of your marriage or partnership. So you don't want Venus or Mercury influencing your Jupiter if you're a woman. Okay, then the last planet is Saturn. Saturn's a neutral to Venus. To, to I'm sorry, to Jupiter. So if Saturn's aspecting Jupiter, ignore him. He has nothing to say about the quality of your husband, whether your husband will do a good or bad job. But Saturn, like the Sun, hurts any planet he's with, okay? So if Saturn's conjunct Jupiter, then he will starve Jupiter. And the, how he'll starve it? He'll create a man that doesn't have a sense of vision and purpose for his own life. Not having a sense of vision and purpose for your own, his own life, how is he going to have a vision and purpose for you in his life? A man can only have a vision and purpose for you in his life once he has a vision and purpose for his own life. Once he has a vision and purpose for his own life, he can fit you into it and have a vision and purpose for you in his life as well. But when Saturn's with Jupiter, the man doesn't have a lot of vision and purpose for his life, and so he doesn't know where to, to include you. So he won't know the right things to do, he won't do the creative things, he won't be planning, thinking, taking the relationship to the next step. You'll have to all do all that. And unfortunately, it doesn't work to take a man with for a ride. Men have to be there, their own conscious, masculine volition. Or else, they're like just dragging a dead dog along. Okay? 
But again, even if Saturn's conjunct Jupiter, you still might have a strong aspect of Mars to Jupiter that balances that out. So, if Saturn's conjunct Jupiter, knock off 60 points. But then also, is Jupiter in Sagittarius in the Navamsha? Okay, now add 60 points. And now you've got a decent husband. You've got a, you know, zero, when all the points average out is decent. Anything above zero is better than average husband. Everything below zero is worse than average husband. Okay? So look at all the friends I'm influencing, Mars and Moon. The enemies influencing Mercury and Venus. Then aspects of Sun will help Jupiter. Aspects of Saturn won't do anything. Conjunctions of Sun and Saturn will hurt Jupiter. And then use that aspect table on the chart calculator at vaultofheavens.com to see how much the plants are aspecting Jupiter. And look at Jupiter's dignity in the Septemsha and Navamsha mostly. The first Varg is not that important for this, but I'll just give you some general idea. And then check if it's in bad dignities in those charts. Give it minus 60 points if it's sleeping, which is in Capricorn or the signs of Mercury or the signs of Libra. Give it 60 points if it's in Pisces, Sag, or Cancer, in Own or Exaltation. And then give it 30 points if it's in Aries, uh, Leo, if it's in a natural friend sign or new, natural neutral. So that's Aries, Leo, um, Aquarius, one, two, three, four, five, six, one more I'm missing. Um, Scorpio, of course, okay? Yeah. So if Jupiter's in Aries, Leo, Aquarius, or Scorpio, give it 30 points. So Jupiter usually, you know, four, or three plus four, seven out of 12 times, you'll get some points for Jupiter being in a sign, which is good. Then Jupiter has more friends. He has, you know, Moon, the Sun is his friend. Most Sun will almost always aspect him, helping him a little bit unless he's conjunct. So the odds are a little in your favor, it's just that when Jupiter's sleeping in a couple charts, he loses so much good, you know, 30, you lose 60 points every time he's sleeping, that if he is sleeping in those charts a lot, you need a lot of friends to bail him out. And if he is getting bailed out, good. Now realize that this is Dasha dependent, okay? You might have a bad Jupiter. It might be sleeping in the sign of Mercury, for instance. And in your Jupiter, Dasha, you got men that you, you attracted men into your life that weren't worthy of you, that you couldn't give your, put your full faith in, that you couldn't fully depend on for one reason or another. So either dated losers or you dated men who are already committed to another woman. But then you go into your Mercury, Dasha, and Mercury, you know, is ruling Jupiter, and Mercury, say, is really strong in your Septumsha, and it's still strong in your um, Novamsha, well, now you're going to marry out of mercurial reasons. So you're still not going to get the Jupiter guy. You're not going to get the guy you can go, oh, I have so much faith in you. You're such a creative genius, and I believe everything you say, and I know you'll always be there for me. You're not going to get that kind of guy. But you'll get a guy that you go, gosh, we're great friends. We talk about everything. There's so many interesting things on Earth we want to explore, and I'm really fulfilled. So you get fulfilled through that planet even though you don't get fulfillment for him as, your, your, as the perfect man, okay? Now, what happens if your Jupiter is either not great or terrible? Or even if it's good but not perfect? Then you can work on it, okay? How do you work on it? You work on your Jupiter by achieving spiritual merit. That's how you make Jupiter bigger, better, because Jupiter is a spiritual merit that manifests as your husband. If you have a problem with the men you're attracting, doesn't mean you need a shorter skirt. Doesn't mean you need a longer skirt. It doesn't mean you need to go to clubs. It doesn't mean you need to stop going to clubs. It means you need to sit down and shut up and do spiritual practices. Okay? In India, the classical thing to do to help a woman get a husband was to pray to Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva works through Jupiter. One of the planets that Ju Lord Shiva works through is Jupiter. So when we pray to Lord, when a woman prays Lord Shiva to give her a good husband, the way Sita did before being chosen by Lord Rama, was is to increase that spiritual merit. But any spiritual practices will do it. So take care of your own joy, take care of your own happiness, which are qualities of Jupiter, and. 
Cultivate your spiritual merit. What is spiritual merit? It's doing all the things that make you feel truly joyous and truly happy. Okay? Happiness and joy that's not dependent on a man is spiritual merit. Okay? And as you cultivate that, as you take care of yourself and learn to create more joy within yourself and your spiritual merit goes up, then you can attract a worthy man. But you're not going to be able to attract a worthy man who's going to be able to be there for you if you try to go about getting a husband any other way. Joining Match.com is not going to work. Going out with your friends more is not going to work. Because if you don't have that spiritual merit and that joyful center, you're not going to attract the right guy. You might get on Match.com and just meet another loser. You might go out with your friends more and only get asked out by losers. And the guy who's capable and confident and knows he wants a woman and knows what he wants to do with her and has a vision for relationship and love in his life, he's talking to somebody else that night. You have to cultivate the spiritual merit. And that's good because the great thing about spiritual merit is that's something that you can do all by yourself. You, get to, you can cultivate spiritual merit without the help of anybody or anything. You can just sit down and pray to Shiva. You can just sit down and become a druid and worship nature and see God in the sun. Instead of running out to find happiness when you're feeling emotionally unhappy and starved, instead of, you know, eating lots of ice cream because you're depressed that there's no love in your life, instead of sitting there and watching soaps or, you know, romantic comedies that distract you from the emptiness of not having a man there who's worthy of you, you learn how to be with yourself, which means you be with those painful feelings and work, take your time to process those painful feelings and ask yourself why you need that so much and what are you doing to yourself for needing that so much when you don't have it? What are the great things you could be doing for yourself right now? Reminds me of the example of the opera singer who was just so desperate for love after this bad breakup, and we're talking by after, I mean months and months after, that she just didn't want to do anything with herself, you know? And I predicted, oh, you're gonna you'll meet someone in a year. And she got so happy with that prediction, she said, oh, well, just a year away, no problem. And then in that year, she started taking care of herself. She started becoming a great woman. Well, the prediction for her marriage ended up being a complete flop, but it's got her to becoming a great woman. And she called me up a year later, she says, I didn't meet someone. I'm like, ooh, sorry, I missed that prediction. And she said, but I'm just so happy, because you saying I would meet someone, made me forget about relationships to where I could actually truly focus on myself for the first time in my life. And I'm so happy with what I'm doing these days. I'm a completely different person. So, give yourself the joy, give yourself the happiness. Don't, you know, ask yourself why you're waiting around, moping around for some two-legged creature to make you happy when you have that own power for yourself and start doing it. Fill, in, fill your life with the things that beautify and glorify your life and achieve that happiness that allows you to be a greater spiritual being. And then you'll attract it. Again, Jupiter is joy and wisdom and spiritual merit. Cultivate your own joy, your own wisdom, and your own spiritual merit, and you will attract a better husband. But run to this and run to that and eat this because you're depressed because you don't have a good man in your life. It's taking you away from your joy. It's taking you away from your wisdom. And it's taken you away from your spiritual merit. As a result, you're not going to attract a better man. You're only going to attract greater disappointment in your life. Okay? So, that's the good news. Cultivate that spiritual merit, inner joy, inner wisdom, which is Jupiter, and you'll attract a better man. That's all women have to do. Wait till you get my video on Venus and you're going to see all the shit the man has to do to attract a woman when his Venus is trashed. And believe me, you'll be glad that you're a woman, that you can just do what you need to do in a room all by yourself. A man has to do so much more if he wants to attract a good woman into his life if he has a bad Venus. Okay, now that you've learned to judge this important planet that represents your spouse, there's another planet you need to study too. The planet we've just talked about represents half the picture. Okay, the other half of the picture is based on uh, your Dara Karaka. Your Dara Karaka is the producer of your spouse, and it's a Jaimini principle where we take the planet that's in the lowest degrees in its sun, and that planet also becomes an indicator of your spouse and the things that your spouse may or may not do in your life. 
and that becomes more personal. So, impersonally, the same for everybody on the planet, Venus is always the wife and Jupiter is always the husband. Okay? And that's because of our similar natures, our gender-dependent nature. All women have a gender-dependent requirement for a husband, and all men have a gender-dependent requirement for a woman, based on Jupiter and Venus. But then as individuals, we all have other requirements for our partner, okay? And that's indicated by the Dharakarka. So for one person, they might have a sun requirement, another person might have a moon requirement. And then that planet also becomes something that they'll experience as a primary thing with their partner, for better or ill, depending on the condition of that planet. So, in the next video, I'm going to cover that. And you want to also look at that video, which is going to be, you know, about the Dara Karaka. So, look at that video to make sure that you get the other half of the picture of your chart. Because if you're you know, your spouse planet is afflicted, but your Dharakarka, your other spouse planet is strong, you can have, still have a decent marriage, a decent relationship. So you have to look at both. Um, okay, so I'm going to get going with that next video, so you can watch that too. Thank you.